a recommendation to the immigration service. Um, so a lot of people ask, you know, well, why five years? Why can't it be two years? You know, what what are all the requirements and how are they going to implement it? Well, nothing's actually happening yet. And so this is just a proposal that some people are suggesting. So if you want a better proposal, you need to act and let USCI know, USCIS know, do you like this proposal? Do you think they should implement it? Do you think they should make changes to it? Um, so we actually have put together a template letter that's on immigrationgirl.com. And I believe we have a link um, in the comments on YouTube where you can go and it gives you instructions on kind of what to say in your letter as well as where to send it. So again, this is just a recommendation that one organization is making to the Biden administration. How do we get the Biden administration actually to implement it? That is through the USCIS Office of Public Engagement. So they, there's an email address there that you can send your suggestions for them to implement this. And then you can also reach out to your congressman and senator. Um, the reason that they are, uh, we're reaching out to them, it, even though their job is to pass laws because they're not doing that. We want them to urge USCIS to do what it can do to provide some kind of relief. So that's kind of the reason. So we're not, and again, we're, we're not suggesting this as the fix to everything. We're not suggesting that you should only do this and not be advocating for anything else. There's obviously a lot of other things wrong with our immigration system. This is a Band-Aid, but it's a Band-Aid that will benefit people. Um, that are stuck in the backlog. So we would recommend trying to get get the Biden administration to take it up and implement it. Um, I, we strongly recommend them. This rumor has been going on. There are a lot of things that are coming up. The next topic that we are going to discuss is an executive order, which is actually also in favor of the immigrants, especially those people who are in artificial intelligence. But what we want to work is those people who've been waiting in line, though, it's going to be forever for them to get the green card. If they would grant the EAD and advance parole for the people whose I-140 has been approved, you know, maybe they can give a certain time. Maybe it's been approved for two years, three years, depending on the time that the administration want to give it. It's going to be very beneficial for a lot of people so that they can get away from these H-1Bs and clutches. There are millions of people who have been given employment authorization. For example, for those people um, that got into uh, earthquake in Nepal and their earthquake is over like 10 years ago, they are still getting the employment authorization. Now, why can't we, the employment of the uh, people who are in the employment-based immigration waiting in line, should get an employment authorization and get away from the H-1Bs? We request your support. We have, uh, Emily has provided a draft letter uh, to send to your congressman, to the senator, to the administration, also to Joe Lufkin, who is a master, uh, who is a very good congressman. She has given a draft of all those things, and uh, we have put the link at the bottom of uh, this video where you can write a letter to your congressman, please use these resources. We have also given our uh, other draft letters for you to make sure that the family members are not counted and make sure all the dates become current. But you know, try keeping these efforts. So sometimes it works, uh, sometimes it may not work, but you should try your efforts. Uh, otherwise, it's maybe a long time for us to get the green card and you will be in the clutches of the H-1Bs. Uh, transfers, uh, change of employers, amendments, every time you have to go outside to get the stamping, all those things you can get away. Please write letters to the congressman so that we can achieve this one. Emily, the next topic seems to be very interesting that uh, yesterday the White House comes up, all of a sudden wakes up, Oops, they feel that artificial intelligence is something very important and uh, they also in their like 100 pages of this execute order or something like that, but they did comment on the immigration side that, that those people, immigrants who are involved in artificial intelligence, they want, the White House want those people to get work permits, to get the green cards or to get whatever, they didn't understand clearly what they can do it, but at least they have given a direction to the, uh, to the USCIS to come up with a policy that can encourage to get more H-1Bs and easier green cards and probably get away from the labor certification, directly go to the EB2 or EB3 application without even going through the testing the labor market if the person is working in artificial intelligence. 
Uh, can you throw more light on it when we can see any benefits for the people who are working in artificial intelligence? How do we determine if this our client is working in artificial intelligence? If there is any benefit that is going to be confirmed at a later date? Yeah, so most importantly, nothing happens overnight with uh, changes in immigration. So the earliest we might start to see some modifications is 90 days. Um, so as of now, the um, Biden administration has directed the immigration service within 90 days to streamline processing times and ensure availability of visa interview appointments for those that are wanting to travel to the U.S. to work, study, or conduct research on AI or other critical and emerging technologies. So three months from now, we may see better processing times and more visa availability. Now, how are they going to differentiate someone who's working in AI versus everybody else? Um, they do kind of have some guidelines for that in the um, executive order. There's a, a link to um, a website that kind of has a list of those particular qualities that they're looking for. I'm hoping that maybe this will help processing times overall as well and visa availability overall. Another thing that they point out is within 120 days, they want some updates to the J-1 visa program, the skills list, trying to um, allow more people to utilize J visas who might be doing research in artificial intelligence. But on top of that, they want um, Department of State to consider implementing a domestic visa renewal program. Now, we already know that that's in process because they're planning on implementing it in January. So um, I'm not sure how new that is, but they do add that within six months, they want to consider a rulemaking to expand that domestic visa renewals to F and J. So right now, the only plan is for this pilot program in January. Hopefully that's gonna likely be for H and L. Maybe six months from now, they'll issue a new regulation. Well, they'll propose a new regulation six months from now that might take another six months to actually be implemented to expand that to J and F. So not sure how fast or helpful that will be. Um, another one within six months, um, they want to re review and initiate policy changes that will clarify um, the pathways that AI experts can use to immigrate. So that's going to be your O1A guidance is going to be updated, your EB1 guidance, your EB2 NIW guidance, exceptional ability guidance, and the international entrepreneur parole that barely anyone can use. Um, so they're going to be modifying that. Now, what's funny to me is they already just recently put out guidance making that more available for STEM. So I'm not sure how much more they need to do because AI, as far as I'm concerned, is STEM. So it should already be covered, but it's it's a nice gesture, I think. Uh, but again, nothing for six months on that. Another big one is to continue the H-1B modifications that they want to do. Um, but again, that's already planned. So nothing new there. But then this weird thing, they say consider initiating a rulemaking. So that means consider proposing a new regulation to enhance the process for adjustment of status. Now, there already is a proposed rulemaking that they haven't proposed yet. It's been on the unified agenda for quite some time. We're expecting a proposed regulation by the end of the year that is specific to how can we streamline adjustment of status. So I kind of feel like that's already in process, but we don't know what it is. What does that mean? And it specifically says non-citizens, and then it adds including experts in AI. So it kind of sounds like they're making this, wanting to propose this regulation for everybody to improve, to enhance adjustment of status, but then they're they're doing it through this, hey, we need to help people with AI. So that's gonna be one to watch out for. And then the last big one is Schedule A. So Schedule A is a provision that allows nurses and physical therapists to skip the labor certification process and go directly to filing um, an EB2 or EB3 I-140 petition. It's different from NIW because Schedule A 
re requires a company to sponsor, but you skip the labor certification because the Department of Labor has already said there's a shortage of workers in this area. So now within 45 days, they're going to consider issuing a request for information to maybe think about adding AI related jobs and STEM related jobs to the Schedule A list. Um, so that sounds good because we're skipping the labor certification, making the process easier, but it's still EB2, EB3. So it doesn't help anyone who's stuck in the backlog. So you skip, skip the labor certification because these jobs are so important, yet you wait in line for 134 years to actually receive a green card if you happen to be born in India. So we definitely need some work on that. And then lastly, they do want Homeland Security to consider what else they can do using their discretionary authority to help people seeking to work, study, or conduct research in AI. That sounds like parole to me. So maybe they're going to provide some sort of parole program like they have United for Ukraine, like they have um, for the international entrepreneur. Maybe they'll make a new parole for which provides work authorization for those in AI. So that could be great news. Emily, overall, I would take this as a very positive news. Definitely no negative news, none whatsoever at all. With the executive order, if anything is going to come out, it's going to be better. Nothing minus at all. Um, the way I'm reading, I mean, I, I overalling or uh, making some changes to the adjustment of status now. Could it be that not counting the family members? Could it be that they would allow filing the people who have an I-140 approval, let's say for more than two years to file the adjustment of status? Could it be that that is an adjustment of, uh, that is a change? Um, could it be that there may be some other changes in the rulemaking as we know that the 140,000 green cards cannot be increased by the administration by themselves. They have to go to the Congress to improve it. But stopping counting the family members, making all the dates current or move, the, allow the people to file the 485 application. These are the things where I think so the administration can it do it, should it do it, and maybe they are willing to do it with these executive orders that I see. So I definitely see some good light there. I hope my colleagues my countrymen will write letters to the administration and to the congressmen to make these uh, modifications and uh, get these things done in a better way so that people can file for 485 right now, um, uh, even though we have limitation and maybe the administration will stop counting the family members. Now, in one of the statements of the, they said increase the visa numbers, how? How would they do it in late? I didn't hear that part. Okay, they said they want to make some changes in the visa, right? Uh, visa appointment availability. Okay. And streamlining they, process. Yeah, they said, they said they are going to make some changes to the O-1 visa, which will allow people of artificial intelligence, especially those who did not get the lottery system and the H-1B, it will make easier for them to apply for O-1 visa. And they probably will make it easier for the people who will apply for EB-1A category if they are artificial intelligence. And specifically, they pointed out that uh, Schedule A, which does not require a labor certification probably for the artificial intelligence, they're going to make it easier for the EB-2 and EB-3 applicants to apply in without going through the labor certification. That's definitely good news, Emily. Anything else, Emily, before we move on to the next topic? No, next topic. So I-140 experience letters. What do you do if you can't, if your employer's not cooperating or <coughs> went out of business? Can you still file an I-140? Can you still get an approval? So first of all, people need to understand that, let's say the labor certification position requires two years experience. You only need experience, let's say you have 10 years experience and the position only requires two years experience. As long as you get the uh, experience letter from one of the employer, which has two years experience, you will meet the requirements for getting the I-140 approval. You don't need all 10 years experience letters to get an I-140 approval. That's the number one note that I want people to understand. Then <clears throat> there are many different things, Emily. In certain labor certification though, where the position requirements are a must, where they, they may need a documentation from the employer 
specifying the softwares and certain programs that they worked on, they may need a letter from the employer. Now, there are ways around it, Emily. Some of the employers will not give the format of that letter, though. They will only give you have been employed from so and so time to so and so. But if they do that, you we just need to get the documentation from the company uh, or whether it's the HR policy or their policy to have the printout of the policy that they have and then cite it to them saying that, hey, look, I get the experience letter in this format only by this company. Here is the reason why they cannot give it. And then probably supplement it if needed with the affidavits from the colleagues. Uh, what are the other things, Emily, that if the employer is not giving the letter in the proper format that you think so? I know you have written two articles in immigrationgirl.com where the employer is not giving a letter or not giving the sufficient letter. Can you explain more on if the employer is not willing to give in the format in which the USCIS wants it? Yeah, we definitely would recommend first getting whatever documentation you can get from the company um, and then getting your W-2s from the time you worked from that company or your pay statements, affidavits from coworkers, former coworkers, former managers. They don't have to still be employed at that company anymore. They just need to be able to confirm that they were working there when you were there and they recall what you worked on and give a more detailed explanation of what your job duties were and what specific skills you had. Um, so that would be the best thing. We recommend two affidavits from coworkers like that, along with whatever experience letter the company is providing, even if it only provides your dates of employment and job title um, with the W-2s. Uh, that's technically generally been sufficient uh, based on our experience. If it's a situation where maybe the company has gone out of business and you can't get anything from the company, then uh, if there's any kind of press release or anything on a website showing that the company is no longer in business, uh, we can print that out and then go back to affidavits from coworkers and W-2s to support that. So you kind of get your primary evidence first, which is whatever documentation you can get from the company, and then you use secondary evidence, which is going to be your affidavits and W-2s or pay statements um, to support that. Um, uh, there's two articles written by Emily in immigrationgirl.com. You can go and refer them to uh, look into just in case if you are missing any of the points. So please look into those things too. Um, child protection status under the current uh, status, what is going to happen with all those people who are children who are born outside the country and the priority date is not expected to move forward for those people, especially for those people we are speaking about January 2015 or afterwards though. Uh, we want children to be prepared that they will not be included in the 485 application along with the parents 485 application unless there are some changes. So they may have to swim themselves. Like for example, they may have to move to F1 visas from H4 and eventually to the H1B and eventually to the green card if the time permits for them to get the green card. So parents need to be prepared. The children need to be prepared about it if the priority date is not going to move. Uh, so we definitely recommend for you guys to write the letters, but if it's not achievable, but be prepared that the uh, children who are born outside the country may not get the green card um, because they may age out by the time your priority date becomes current. So they, if they become 21 and by the time your filing date doesn't become current, they will not be able to adjust status. So of course, there are some period of time where they will be able to deduct the period of time the I-140 is pending will be deducted from the time period of their age. Other than that ex exception that if the filing dates doesn't become current, they will be kicked out though. Emily, there are some recent changes in Child Service Protection Act where previously they were considering only the final action date to be current. Now they made it that even the filing dates become current and most of the people are aware of it. Um, but um, but the people who uh, and, 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 and the I-140, especially if the I-140 is pending for a period of time, they can deduct the time from the 21 years and they can take advantage of it too. But looking at the structure, what's going on, Emily, right now, especially for those people whose priority date is after 2015, January of 2015, uh, um, uh, January of 2015, Emily, looks like they will not be able to meet the requirements, especially if the 
children are in teenage, they probably, most probably won't be able to meet the requirements. Do you have any suggestions for them? Yeah, uh, that's one of the, the difficulties is even with the change that they made earlier this year to go by the filing date, that's not going to be enough to help the majority of people. Um, even with this I-140 EAD AP recommendation, that's not going to be enough to help people. Um, so I think that the best thing right now is to number one, make sure your kids are aware of this issue. Uh, I do recommend the group called Improve the Dream. Um, they are a group of kids that are aging out, facing age out issues that are banding together. And they've done a lot in terms of advocacy. They have a lot of support on Capitol Hill. Um, they seem to have a pretty good um, network to uh, try to get Congress to fix this. Uh, and so that means you've got, they need to write letters to their congressman, write letters to their senator. Uh, even if we can't get, you know, major immigration reform, this is one tweak that can really help a lot of people and just seems fair given uh, the circumstances. So that's one thing. Um, and another thought that I had is, you know, what if people who have their I-140 approved, their priority dates locked in, what if they were allowed to file a second I-140 with the same company and USCIS just keeps that I-140 pending? Why would you want to do that? Uh, because the number of days that your I-140 is pending gets deducted from the child's age. So even if the child turns 21, while that I-140 is pending and they keep it pending until the priority date becomes current, the child will never age out. Um, so I know this doesn't help everybody because it doesn't help people who maybe change jobs after their child turned 21 or something like that, but it's maybe a small band-aid that we could try to propose to USCIS, just like this White House initiative has, is going to propose the I-140 EAD and AP. Um, so I wrote a post about that uh, maybe two weeks ago on immigrationgirl.com, asking for people's feedback, asking if what kind of problems would be faced, what things wouldn't it help, wouldn't it fix. So if you want to put, leave your comments there and then maybe we can come up with some letters and some templates that we can send again to the Office of Public Engagement, the Ombudsman Office, anyone that we can think of to try to provide some kind of relief for people. Anything else, Emily, before I go to questions? Nope, I think we can move on to questions. Uh, Punit has this question, if we are allowed to file EAD and AP based on I-140, will that save the kids from aging out? Uh, we don't know yet. We have to look into if the administration is going to move on it, if it's going to move on it. Will they tell that the kids' age will be protected? Most probably they would consider it at this point of time. That's all I can tell. But will they do it or not? I don't know at this point of time. We should definitely recommend the administration to do it. Rahul has this question from YouTube. His, uh, he, his, after three years, he got the 485 interview. Then they found out there is somebody else with the same name, Rahul Kumar. Um, and because of that, they, and that person has some court case against him. And because of that, they are not be able to give him the green card. What is the solution for it, though? Definitely sue the USCIS. Assuming that your final action date is current, though, the best thing is to sue you there. Because it's their duty to find out if that Rahul Kumar is the same as you. If you are that bad guy with all the murder case against you, we definitely don't want you to be given EAD at all. That's the wrong thing to do. You should, your EAD, your 485 should be denied. So I want you to approach the court and file a court case against USCIS. Hey, you know, why are you putting me in dilemma with some other Rahul Kumar? I am a different Rahul Kumar. If, uh, and and uh, and that's the best solution under the conditions that you are is to go to the court because the judge will look into it. If that Rahul Kumar and you are the same person, if it's not, then he will he may force the USCIS to adjudicate your case faster. A uh, question from Emily: uh, Do you see USCIS complying with the 20-day timeline to respond to our FOIA request, Freedom of Information Act? Or are we looking at the six to eight months before we get a response? So a little backstory, uh, Stephen Brown in our office 
um, has been submitting lots of Freedom of Information Act requests with different agencies trying to get to um, information that should be publicly available so that the agencies are transparent, but they are not publishing this information. So he's submitting a new Freedom of Information Act request to USCIS, asking for a lot of data related to employment-based 485s, priority dates, transfer of underlying basis. There's a whole laundry list of things, basically trying to get back the inventory that they used to put out. So do we see them complying and responding to us within 20 days? No, I have no. zero <laughs> confidence that that will happen, but we do intend to sue them when they don't respond within the required time frame to hopefully get a faster response. Uh, so yeah, we have no guarantee, there's no likelihood. The only agency that has actually responded timely to our FOIA request has been the Department of Labor. A uh, question that comes from Goswami um, from Facebook is, um, is the 180 pending data for the AOS, does that include the family members or it's only the primary applicant? It does include the family members. Uh, um, Krishna says, my employer had an acquisition and I'll be starting next month as an employee of the newly acquired company. And the attorney for the new company is saying that amendments are not needed. Um, and yeah, so that's correct. If the new company that has taken you on is considered a successor in interest, it doesn't require an H-1B transfer. It doesn't require an amendment as long as your job is the same, your salary is the same, your work location is the same, job duties are the same. Um, so if they're truly just transitioning you to the new company, amendments are not required. They do have to update the public access file, but it should be a smooth transition for that. Now on the green card side, if you already have your I-140 approved with the old company, but you've not filed the 485 yet because your date is not current, an I-140 amendment is required. Mohan Singh says that he, there are 100 people who he, um, they're ready to come to our office to sue the USCIS because they're taking the money for the I-140 and the legal fees and all those things. And they cannot, we cannot get the green card for 100 years. Um, there must be legal reasons for us to sue the USCIS, though. Um, they never get it. I mean, the Congress limited that the 140,000 green cards to be given every year. So if we are going to go to the court and tell them to violate the law that is being passed by the Congress, the court will not do that. Uh, the court will not do it. If there is something that wrong they are doing, uh, for example, if they are delaying the EAD, our advanced rules, which they are supposed to approve it. It's an interim benefit. That's definitely a thing that we can sue if the final action date is current and they are not approving the 48 application. That probably is uh, worth going for, for the cost that what you're speaking, Mohan Singh. Um, I don't think so. We will be ready to take up the case, though. There must be a legal reasoning for us to go through the USCIS. Uh, Clevy26 says, if one moves from H-1B to H-4 EAD, are they using up their six-year limit of H-1B? And if not, can they move back to H-1B and use whatever time was left? So someone who changes status to H-4 prior to using up their six-year limit, the clock stops. Um, so you're no longer um, ticking towards your six-year limit. So then once you're on H-4, if maybe you had three months left on H-1B, you can in the future file a change of status back to H-1B to get those three months left. So a lot of people, um, while they're on H-4 and H-4 EAD, they keep working for the company, they work through the PERM labor certification, they get their I-140 approved. You can get both a labor and I-140 approved while you're on H-4 EAD. And then they file a change of status back to H-1B and get a three-year H-1B. They don't need that recapture time because um, they can get three years based on their approved I-140. Um, question with regards to, can I switch the job on EB-1 approved I-145 for it, 5485 that is not yet approved? Uh, assuming uh, you're speaking about EB-1A, EB-1B, or EB-1C, all these three categories, though, you can switch the job after six months, definitely, though. Now, for the EB1C and EB1B, you can switch the job uh, after six months. When it comes to the EB1A, you practically can switch the jobs. There are some exceptions available that you can switch the job within six months also. 
Um, CG says my 485 is pending for a conditional green card, but I also have an EB2 I-140 approval. Once I get the conditional green card, will USCIS revoke my I-140? So conditional green card, that's either family-based, immediate relative, and you've been married for less than two years, or the EB-5 category, uh, where you get the conditional green card. But no, that has no impact on your approved I-140 and EB-2. That only goes away if the company withdraws it. Nitish Jawaji has is a PhD student in artificial intelligence on F1 with an approved I-140. Does the executive order help him in any way? Absolutely, though. You are an F1. So one thing is that there may be that they may create some special categories for the H1B. We don't know. Or they may, they may give preference to the, um, to the artificial intelligence people on H1B. That's one thing. If not, you may be easily qualified for O1 visa to apply. Um, uh, when you said your I-140 is approved, I don't know what you mean by I-140. Is it EB-1, EB-2, or EB-3? If it's EB-2 and EB-3, there is a chance that you may upgrade it to EB-1 category uh, because you are in artificial intelligence because what they execute order when I read it is that they are going to make it more easier for people who are working in artificial intelligence to get the I-140 in EB-1 category. So definitely everything looks to be in more positive direction for you to benefit, benefit from this execute order. Now, how long it's going to take for them to get implemented, that is a matter to be seen. But most probably it will be implemented because it's in their best interest to keep the people like you in United States. Uh, he got an NIW, yeah, so you got an NIW, you can move from EB2 to EB1 category. That may be a very good option for you. Uh, Samuel says, if my employer does the green card, will there be any issue for an E3 extension? So E3s are kind of like H-1Bs, but they are for citizens of Australia. Uh, there are more, um, there's generally not a lottery process. There's, there is a limit that the cap is never reached. And there's no generally I-129 filing with USCIS. You can go straight to the consulate with your approved LCA and an offer letter from your company. So what's different about the E3 compared to an H-1B is E3 is not a dual intent visa, meaning that you have to only have non-immigrant intent while you are on an E3. And that can come up when you're applying for the visa at the consulate when you are traveling into the US or if you do file an extension with USCIS. So uh, depending on the timing and depending on your country of birth, so you may be an Australian citizen, but were you born in Australia? If yes, then it's very likely that you can get through the different parts of the green card process and time your extension of your E3 before you file your I-140 petition, and then after you get your E3 extended, file your I-140 and your 485. If you were born in India, though, that's going to be much tougher, and eventually you may have difficulty with your E3 extension, so you may have to eventually switch over to an H-1B, even though you qualify for an E3. Um, Sally has this question. My I-140 was filed by old company in July 2023, but they laid me off in September 2023. My old company legal team told me that they will not revoke the I-140 in any situation. What are the options for the priority? Assuming that the I-140 is approved, you will have no problem in retaining the priority date uh, when you move on to the next company and when the next company files a labor and I-140 application. Now, for you to extend the H-1B beyond six years, for you to use that I-140 to apply for the H-4 EAD for your spouse, though, the I-140 not only must be approved, but it must not be withdrawn for a period of 680 days after it's been approved. Now, um, that we have seen a lot of companies, though, they don't withdraw the I-140s. Um, they just keep it as it is. They don't withdraw the I-140s. There are very rarely some of the companies withdraw the I-140. So definitely if the company is not withdrawing and assuming that the I-140 is approved and they won't withdraw for the next 180 days, you will be very much benefited with the I-140 application that was already filed for you. Uh, Ravi says my H-1B visa is stamped until March, 2024. I need to travel to India in December, 2023 for one month. Can I travel if my H-1B extension application is pending with USCIS? Um, 
Yes, but I generally don't recommend it. So it's better to either file the extension first, get it approved, and then travel and come back, or travel and come back and then file your extension. That's what I recommend to my clients because otherwise you're going to end up with the wrong I-94 number on your extension approval. Um, beyond that, though, even though your visa is expiring in March, you can still travel in December. That visa remains valid until it expires. Uh, so as long as you have a valid I-797 with an I-94 also that has not expired, you can come back um, anytime up till March 2024. Rajam Ali has this question. I have a concurrent uh, H-1B and working for two jobs. Will that have any impact on my future GC? I have an approved I-140. No, it will not have any negative impact, none whatsoever at all for you on the GC. Will it have any positive effect? Maybe, maybe not, but it will not have any negative effect. I don't know why people who are working on the concurrent H1B feel that they're doing like a drug dealing or something like that. No, you're not. Um, there are a lot of doctors that we represent. Some of them were uh, one of the persons that I worked with. Uh, that guy's working with six different companies. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, my wife gets W-2s from eight different companies every year. That's nothing wrong with it. I don't know why people who are working concurrently with different companies feeling that it's a very bad thing they're doing. No, you're doing very noble thing. Nothing wrong with it. In fact, recently I read an um, uh, interview published by for the Narayan Murthy, who is the CEO of the Infosys, he said that people should start working 70 hours a week, which I am one of the proponent of it. I like it. <laughs> I'm almost doing it. But yeah, uh, nothing wrong with it, guys. Nothing wrong. I, we salute you guys working so hard um, and paying taxes for us. That's very good for us. Uh, David says, I applied for PERM June 20th, 2023, EB2 Rest of World, and my L1 B is getting expired in November 2024. Is it possible to go for an extension while waiting for the 485? So the L1B can only be extended for a total of five years. So if you are hitting your five year limit, regardless of what's going on with your green card process, you cannot extend further. The only way to extend an L1B is if you are later converted to a managerial position or an executive position in the US then you can convert from L1B to L1A to get an extra two years. Um, so that may give you enough time to get the 485 filed. Uh, but it's not like an H1B where you can extend beyond the six year limit based on a pending PERM or a pending I-140 or an approved I-140. There is no such thing for L1s. Emily, I have this question coming from YouTube. I want attention. I'm going to answer the question and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, if someone on EAD lost the job in the university, is it possible to work on EAD on non-academic jobs? Assuming that this gentleman probably got a EB1B I-140 approved and filed a 485 application, now he's moving to the non-academic jobs. I believe I don't see any problem in it. The reason is that he's still in the similar profession for which he has been doing academic jobs, though. So, People need to move away from academic jobs and they need to be productive in the industry once they move out from the academic jobs. Since he's on the EB1B on one particular segment, let's say, for example, he's in biochemistry and now he's moving into the non-academic jobs, but at the same time working on biochemistry, I don't see that as a problem. Do you? No, I don't. Yeah, I agree with you that um... USCIS is pretty liberal in how it applies AC21, which is the portability, allowing you to keep your green card process going with the new employer. Um, so as long as you're doing something in the similar area, um, furthering those pursuits, even though the type of employer is different, I don't see a problem with that. It's like a software engineer moving from a tech company to a manufacturing company. You're still doing the software engineering, um, just a different industry. So I don't see any problem. Uh, Priya has a personal question. It's not a legal question because she knows what the law is. Um, she has an EB2 I-140 approved under 2018 priority date. Um, and now she has moved to a different company. They filed a poem in November 2022. 
does it make sense to stay with the company because her prior to date is 2018? She's getting good offers. Can she move to a different company? I'm not going to answer the question Priya to you, but I will tell you what I will do based on what the studies that I have right now. I am going, if I'm getting a better offer somewhere else, I am moving because I'm not expecting the priority date to move <coughs> to 2018 sooner. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling what I will do if I were you. Um, Yen says my max out is nearing in December 2023, just around the corner. And the perm has been filed with employer A in March of 2023. So I don't see any likelihood that that perm is going to be approved in time. Um, he's also got a perm filed with a different company, but that wasn't filed until September 2023. He's asking, can I file an H1 transfer with that other employer? And while I'm waiting for that em approval, work for that employer even after the max out? Absolutely not. Do not do that. You are only eligible to get an H1B until your max out date. Just filing a frivolous transfer, uh, which I think that would be knowing that you've maxed out, um, does not give you work authorization. So no, that is not a good plan. Uh, we have done a number of videos on options when you are maxing out, such as traveling to your home country um, and staying there until you get your I-140 approved, traveling to Mexico using automatic revalidation and trying to get a couple of months of recapture time, changing status to another visa category, but filing an H-1B extension when you're not eligible for it, definitely not an option. Um, Albert, uh, uh, Mr. Berg has this question that he wants to work in a hotel or pub as a part job. Um, definitely doesn't look to be that he was teaching in that side of profession in the academic area. Definitely the answer for you is no, that is not allowed. A uh, question that is coming from um, the doctor here, um, from a dragon doctor, um, he's doing an internal medicine physician job. EAD is approved, but want to move to cardiology fellowship. Can I do fellowship on EAD? My approval is on EB1A. That's a tough question, though. Uh, yes and no. Um, it's better that you consult a lawyer because the question about the green card is that it's a future job that what you will be doing. There are exceptions available. And, and still, the internal medicine is a pathway to go to the cardiology. What I was being told is that to you can't directly go to cardiology. You need to have an internal medicine before you go to cardiology, though. So we could, I think so. Uh, what do you say, Emily? Internal medicine guy moving into cardiology? I don't see the problem in the change of field, but it being a fellowship, is that a full-time position that qualifies for AC21? That would be my concern. What if, you know, depending on if it's the employer, what if the employer says that, yeah, I want you to do your fellowship and come back and work for me? as a, so there are yeah, ways. if that original job offer is still there, I don't yeah. see a problem. Yeah. There are some exemptions available. You may have to consult a lawyer, though. Um, Anurud says, have you seen any success with EAD compelling circumstances? I got a denial saying I'm not eligible for an extension because they assumed it was an OPT EAD. Um, yeah, so Ryan Wilk in our office handles those, and he's said a lot of success in the initial as well as the extensions. Um, so I would recommend setting up a consultation with him. You can do that by going to rnlawgroup.com and there's a button for consultation. You can select his name. You can upload the denial notice so he can review it in advance before your appointment. And then he can give you some ideas on whether it makes sense to file a motion to reopen or reconsider or refile the application. Yeah, recently he got one of the uh, motion to reopen overturned. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, denial overturned in the Ryan Big Good, good. Uh, Deepanjit says, is there any benefit to EB2 NIW over regular EB2 for Indians? Um, obviously, it's the same EB2, so same backlog. The main benefit is NIW does not require an employer sponsor versus EB2 regular, which does. It requires you to go through the labor certification process. 
Um, so not having that sponsor and being able to self-sponsor can be helpful in the event that your employer is not willing to sponsor or they're delaying sponsorship, or maybe you left that company after they started the process. So it does give you a little bit more wiggle room, uh, but you still have the long wait if you're born in India. Um, question from Saranch Bhagga. Uh, for H1B older, I-140 approved, if I leave the United States, go back to India, then after a few years, if I want to come back, is a job offer with a H1B approval, is that enough for me to come back? Or is there anything else? Absolutely, you're right. You don't need anything else. You just need a H1B. Of course, you have to go for stamping and then you have to come back. You can use the old I-140 approval, assuming that old I-140 was not withdrawn within 180 days after it's been approved. You are good. Absolutely not a problem. Suravani says, if the company is winding down its operations, what happens to the approved I-140 status for full-time employees? So um, when a company goes out of business, the I-140 is considered automatically revoked. Um, but if that I-140 has been approved for at least 180 days, you do um, get to continue using that I-140 for H-1B extensions beyond the six-year limit, H-4 EADs, and you get to keep the priority date. But your new employer will need to file new labor certification new I-140 because you cannot use that old I-140 to actually receive the green card. Now, if that company is winding down its operations because it merged into another company, then you have to look at, is the new company a successor in interest? And if it is, that company files an amended I-140 to keep your priority date, document that it's a successor in interest, that the job's the same, and that they have the ability to pay your salary, and then your I-140 remains intact. Dragon has this question. Uh, it seems to be a very simple question for me to answer. While keeping his primary job as an internal medicine, can he do the moonlighting, do other extra jobs on the adjustment of status CED? The answer is simply yes, you can. Absolutely not a problem. Uh, Deepak says, what is happening with F2A? I have EB2, EB3, and F2A applications pending. Yes, it is a mess. Um, it's partly, you know, consulates had shut down during COVID and all of those family-based uh, green cards went wasted, although they didn't get wasted, they went to employment-based the following year and some of those got wasted. But now we just have this buildup of people that have been waiting since COVID times. That's one of the issues. And then we also have a number of people where the family got separated in their employment-based process and the main applicants, their green card and the spouse is still pending. So they go back and file the I-130 in the F2A category. So that has increased the number of people in that category. So yeah, it it, it is a mess and there's just no good option when you've got all these different cases going on and none of them are moving forward. Clevy26 from YouTube has this question that he wants to move from H1 to H4 plus EAD. And can he come back and use the leftover six years of the H1B at any point of time? The answer is simply yes. You can come back. Let's say, for example, you have used five years of H1B. You move to H4 plus EAD. At a later date, you can come back and use the leftover H1B without going through the lottery system. There's another tip. A lot of people forget about it that on H-4 EAD, you are still allowed to file the labor certification by 140. You don't have to be on H-1B to file the labor in I-140. So you can move to H-4 plus EAD and then still file the I-140 and still come back to H-1B. Absolutely not a problem. Uh, what is the uh, timeline? So go ahead, Emily. I was going to say, uh, Sri says, with the proposed H-1 regulations, would USCIS approved an H-1B for a software engineer with a mechanical engineering degree, 10 years experience, and a diploma in data analytics? So he's referring to the proposed regulations that uh, USCIS is trying to kind of modify the definition of specialty occupation and make sure that the employee that's being sponsored, their qualifications closely align or are directly related to the position. So if you're saying that you're going to be a software developer, 
USCIS typically wants to see that you have a degree in computer science or software engineering. What about someone who's got a mechanical engineering degree? Um, typically, in that case, I think you could still qualify if you have experience in software development or engineering because you can combine your bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering with experience in software development to get the equivalent of a bachelor's degree in computer science or software engineering. Um, so someone can still qualify in that situation, but someone who has just a uh, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and no experience in IT yet may not be able to qualify if these regulations are modified that way. Deepanjit Kohli from YouTube has this question. I'm an Indian citizen. If I, I, my, I have an I-140 approval, and if I get, um, if I go to Canada and become a Canadian citizen, can I retain the priority date for which I have an I-140 approval? Absolutely, you can. No problem. You can retain. Just because you change the citizenship, you are still the same, the Panjit Kohli, and you will get the priority date moved to the new company. Just because you change the citizenship, no problem for you at all. So Ranj says, if I'm on H-1B and want to move to H-4 to reclaim and stop the H-1B six-year limit clock, how can I proceed without causing a disruption in my employment? Um, so one, I'm assuming your spouse is on H-1B and hopefully has an approved I-140, so you're thinking of moving to H-4 and getting the EAD. Um, so one way to do it depending on if your spouse's H-1B is expiring soon and their employer is planning to file an H-1B extension, you can have the employer file that H-1B extension and premium processing and include the change of status to H-4 and the EAD with it all together. And under the settlement agreement, USCIS is supposed to approve all of them together. And they are doing that in probably 95 to 99% of the cases. There are still some that are being left behind and that can create a problem if you do hit your six year limit. The other thing that people are doing is exiting the US, working remotely for their company in their home country, getting the H-4 visa stamp, coming back into the US on H-4, you have to stop working at that moment, file the H-4 EAD and then go back to your home country and wait for the EAD to be approved while you work remotely. I just filed one of those today. Um, so that's becoming more and more common. Um, Raj has his priority date April 2012, which he can file the 485 application. He recently came uh, to United States. I think so he left in 2016, now he came back. Um, can he file the 485 application right now? His family is outside the country and they can apply once they are in USA. Assuming that you are working with the same company that has the I-140 approval and they are willing to file the 485, the answer is yes, you can file the 485 application since your filing dates are current right now. But one caution that I have is that if you if you get the green card though without your family, how would they come into the United States? They can't come on H-4 or L-1B visa because you're no longer an L-1 or H-1B. Then it's going to be become a major problem for them to come into the United States. You have to file something called F2A or following to join. That's going to take three years for them to come into the United States. <coughs> since your priority date is current, since you can file the 485, I will have them come on H4 or L1B, whatever visa they are eligible for. Have them come here in the United States, file the 485 application. Then they can go back if they want to, because on L1B they can keep on coming back though. So, but still um, there are some restrictions you need to look into it. What if they go outside the country without the advanced parole and you get the green card, they can't come back in L1B. So that's a technical violation too. So I would rather want the family together with you, file the 485 and get the green card. That would be the best. But technically to answer your question, yes, you can file the 485 without your family. Uh, Nikila says, will perm processing speed up? I don't see that in the near future. Um, one of the reasons is they switched over from filing perm in the perm system to filing perm in the flag system and they revamped the whole form um, and they have not even started adjudicating those cases yet and we know from a FOIA request that they have not even started training officers on how to adjudicate cases using this new form. 
So I expect there to be some delays once they get to those form. Um, I think it was in August that we made the switch. And so they're still working on November 2022 cases. So eight months from now, um, things might get worse when they get to that new form. We do have a lawsuit pending on this exact issue, seeking to get a judge to confirm that this delay is unreasonable because clearly processing times have just skyrocketed over the last several years. So hopefully that will help. Uh, but uh, without that, I don't see much hope. Question from Maria Pan. I'm on H1B EB2. My prior date is December 2022. If I move to India for four years, can I come back to USA uh, using the EB2 with a different employer on H1B? Will that be a problem? Absolutely not a problem. You can use that I-140, company A's I-140, to come back on company B's H1B. Not a problem at all. Right. I think we are about out of time for today. Uh, so thank you all for joining us. Remember, you can go to rnlawgroup.com to set up a consultation with us or any of our attorneys, and we would be happy to uh, guide you further. Thank you very much for tuning in.